And so, Chris, based on your experience, where do students start? Can you describe the, the first introduction students typically have to two quantitative uh, variables? Well, if you look at the standards, most state standards or common core standards, the, most, uh, the first formal introduction would probably be in middle school, uh, typically at eighth grade. But students start thinking about association in elementary school very informally. And they start asking questions, association questions, at the elementary level. Uh, to give you an example, I could see uh, as a class project at the elementary level, uh, students might be interested in knowing if they have certain plant seeds and they plant these seeds, uh, if different exposures to sunlight might make a difference in how much they grow after six weeks. So they might look to see is there an association between the amount of sunlight that they receive uh, versus how tall the plants become after six weeks. So as students move on through sort of a progression of learning, what, what do they encounter in, in typically in schools and, and in, in a, thinking about a, a larger progression? Right. Well, if we go back to the elementary level, when students first start looking at scatter plots, or maybe it's the middle school level before they start seeing these scatter plots, what we typically expect students to do is to look at the data and start looking for clusters. Uh, how do points start clustering in the scatter plot, but also looking for patterns, looking for trends. So by the time, let's say, they get to eighth grade, um, Hopefully, they're thinking about how do I describe the trend? Is it positive? Is it negative? Um, how do I describe the strength of the association that I'm seeing in the scatter plot? And by the time they're in eighth grade, we're hoping that they're now ready to try to more definitively quantify that strength of the relationship. And that's where we would want them to start thinking about coming up with a numerical measure that might help them quantify that strength. We want students to be able to start thinking conceptually. Okay, I have this scatter plot in front of me. I see this clustering of points. I see this trend. Um, how can I think about going further with the scatter plot to more quantify that? And I think a natural thing to do is to divide the scatter plot into four regions and think of the idea in terms of quadrants. And then look to see. Once you divide that scatter plot into four regions, and you can use your mean lines for X and Y, you start to see, oh, well my points, if I have sort of a positive trend, my points are starting to cluster in what we are used to calling quadrant one and quadrant three, or region one, region three. If I have more of a negative trend, they're clustering in quadrants two and quadrants four. Now what's a way that I could quantify that? Well, at the middle school level, I think what's very intuitive is, well, I can start counting points. And I can look to see where do most of my points lie in terms of the number of points. Uh, this is what I call the how many approach. So what we recommend in the guidelines at level B is that we think about something called the quadrant count ratio. Very easy for students to calculate this. Once they've taken their scatter plot and they've divided it into these four regions, then if they are noticing a positive trend, count all the points that are in quadrant one and quadrant three, and then subtract from that the number of points in quadrant two and quadrant four, and then divide by the number of points that you have. Now what should happen is the quadrant count ratio will always be between a negative one and a positive one. So if the most of your points are in the first quadrant and the third quadrant, I'm going to expect that this QCR, as we call it, will be positive. And if the majority of the points are in those two quadrants, I'm going to expect it to be close to one. Whereas if they're mostly in quadrants two or quadrants four, it's going to be negative, which indicates the direction. And I would expect it to be close to a negative one. If the points are kind of randomly scattered in the four quadrants, I'm going to expect this ratio to be close to zero. And what's really nice is it helps to give them a sense of those sort of fuzzy words that we use when we try to describe association. You know, students are constantly saying, 
Well, is it a strong relationship? Is it a moderately strong relationship? Is it a very strong relationship? How do I, how do I tell that just by visualizing the graph? And hopefully this QCR will start to give them a better sense of kind of precision with their words in describing the association. So based on your experiences, what, what are some of the challenges that students face as they, they start to learn about statistical association as, as these ideas develop? Well, I think one, of the, one that we've already talked about is trying to figure out how to quantify the strength mm -hmm. of the association and trying to decide if that association is meaningful. You know, in statistics, you know, we, we're constantly asking ourselves the question, is what we're observing something that's due to just random variation, random chance variation, or is this real? So is this a real association, or is this something that's just due to random variation? That's very hard for students to put um, to put a definitive yes or no on. So I think that's why it's so important that they evolve to finding other tools. Not only do they use a correlation coefficient to try to help them, but also in eighth grade, this is when they're going to start thinking about fitting lines and thinking about do I see that I have a linear relationship here with these points and how much are my points clustering around that line that I fit. But one of the other big challenges from all of this that students run into is, for example, what if you have a scatter plot where you've got a nice trend, you see there's a clustering of points, but you may have one or two points that's lying away from that trend. How's that going to affect how you quantify the association? So, for example, if I had a scatter plot, and let's say we consider looking at uh, a couple of variables that are related to education, uh, average expenditure that we have with students per student mm -hmm. versus, let's say, a teacher's average salary. Okay. okay? And if we look at the scatter plot, uh, we have one here for the 51 states and D.C. What I notice is that there does seem to be sort of a nice positive trend, clustering of points. But I do see one or two observations here that are falling outside this trend in this cluster. So how's that going to affect a correlation coefficient that I might find to measure the strength of that? Or how might it affect a line that I would try to fit to the data? So students, when you ask them you know, to quantify the strength, they're asking themselves the question, do I include those points or not? in this because the rest of the points seem to fall pretty nicely so should I really bring those into play and I think that's a real struggle for them. Mm. Uh, the other thing that happens with bivariate analysis in terms of outliers or unusual observations is that you can also have the problem of where instead of a point falling outside the cluster of the, of the trend that you're observing you might actually have a point that falls far away from the other x values and far away from the other y values, but in terms of the cluster of points, it's within the trend. So students might see it as an outlier, yes. but it's not really an outlier in, in terms of the trend. Of the, in terms of the trend. Yeah. In fact, what it's going to do is strengthen That's the right. correlation. Yeah. So these ideas that we've been talking about in the middle and high school level, as students transition to college mm -hmm. and, or, or maybe take an AP statistics mm -hmm. class in high school, um, how do the ideas help set students up for success in, in those, those classes? What we're trying to teach our students at K-12, through we're not necessarily trying to teach them all the tools of a practicing statistician. That's what college courses are for. What we're trying to do at K-12 through is to try to help our students conceptually understand what's going on in that statistical problem solving process and provide them with some tools that they can evolve 
to the more formal methods that we use as practicing statisticians. Some of those tools are statistical habits of mind, right? Oh, These opportunities to, to think about yes. what are statistical ways of thinking. Right? That is exactly right. And it's really, I think by the time students graduate, I often say that what I want them to be are good questioners. I, I want them to be good consumers of statistical information. And these tools that we use to help them evolve allows them to know the questions that they need to ask. You want them to understand the beauty of statistics by the time they graduate from high school. But as important or more important, you want them to understand how to be healthy skeptics of statistical information that they might encounter. Mm -hmm. And the only way that that's going to happen is to help develop them conceptually with these big ideas.